Amen. All right. So I did this for the first service. Disclaimer. Uh, I grew up in the Church of God in Christ, which is a black Pentecostal denomination. And what that means is I look forward to hearing y'all say something back to me when I'm preaching. (laughs) It really is okay. I promise it is. I'm not going to get distracted. And it's not rude. All right. Thank you. There we go. Practice. Practice makes perfect. Um, And if you choose not to, that's also okay. But I'm going to assume that you didn't hear me the first time. (laughs) Right? Not because I need affirmation. Because I, as a preacher, want to make sure that I'm not talking to myself. Okay? And so, uh, as Judith mentioned, my name is Joshua Manning. I have the privilege of serving as Grace, at the pastor of Grace Chapel. Uh, Grace Chapel was kind enough to let me come here this morning. And so I'm glad that we have an associate pastor now uh, who is willing to stand in the gap. And uh, some people who are willing to let me come and be a part of what God is doing here in another uh, station in the United Methodist Church, if you will. I'm also happy to be one of these fresh voices that uh, Pastor Matt mentioned uh, I don't know how long I'm going to age into that category. Uh, my understanding is that the cutoff for young clergy is like 35, so I still have a couple more years before I get there. Uh, but here's my anticipation that they're going to move that up to 40. <laughs> and, then I, and then I'm still going to be in that category. <laughs> That's my anticipation. Um, I do know a couple of people here. I'm just going to drop some names so that we, we all know. I have an opportunity to serve as the uh, chair of the district committee on ordained ministry. What that means is I get to help us make decisions about um, how we might invite people to live into their call in United Methodist Church. So I know uh, Reverend Phil Mercer, Phil, good to see you, man. Uh, Alice Coder, Carolyn Marr. I know a couple other, a couple of people. I know a couple people here. Uh, Gary, I see you, so I'm glad, I'm glad to see you. I have some colleagues here who can keep me on track um, because I have a tendency to get off track. Uh, but as, as they are here and, and I'm celebrating them, I, I do want to thank God also uh, publicly for the Gastons. Uh, for those of you who know, uh, the Reverend Camille Gaston or Cami uh, served as a district superintendent for quite some time. And she was the one that convinced the North Texas Conference cabinet that I should learn how to be a pastor in South Dallas. Uh, <laughs> and so um, before I even knew what it meant to be a United Methodist minister. And so uh, because Cami invited me into that, I'm here this morning. And so if you don't like something that was said, you know who to find. <laughs> uh, find Cammy. And so that Joshua Manning guy that you, that you invited into ministry, yeah, don't like him. So they just make sure you let her know that. Don't tell me. It's going to hurt my feelings very deeply. It's not. All right. Um, so I'm also glad to be in a church. I have a lot of introductions. I, I just like to talk to people from the stage. I'm an introvert. So this is good for me. Uh, but I am so glad to be in a place where you guys also mosey in to worship because at Grace Chapel, worship starts at 11 and people get there at 11.20. <laughs> and so I'm so glad to be in another place where God's people know that time is flexible. <laughs> and what that means is I'm looking at a clock back there. And I, 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 I always tell people, I think professional football hasn't started yet. So I think you, you, hopefully you guys have some time. Some. I'm not going to take all of it. I just hope you have some time since there's not a game starting at one to my understanding. Not anything you want to watch, right? It's not, a, it's, the season's not started yet. So anyway, uh, as we're doing that, I want to invite you to uh, the word of God this morning here in the book of Acts chapter 10. We're going to read verses 19 through 20 together. Um, but as we are getting ready to read that, I do want to invite you to read that entire chapter because I'm going to mention a bunch of different verses that aren't in this reading, um, but I do think they help give context. So we're going to read Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 20. I'm going to read from the New Revised Standard Version Updated Edition, so NRSV UE, if you're following along. Uh, Listen now for a word from the Lord. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. 
Then he heard a voice saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. And the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision that he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, look, three men are searching for you. Now get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks, we give you praise, for you are the great I am. You are the one who knows and does all things well. You walk with us, you talk with us, and remind us, God, that we are loved by you. God, we are so grateful for the ways in which we have already experienced your presence here today for the pleasantries that we have exchanged with one another, through the prayers that have been offered, through the songs that have been sung. But God, in this moment, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to be receptive to what your spirit is saying to the church. Speak, Lord, for your children are listening. Speak to our situations, speak to our circumstances, speak to our fears, our anxieties, and our uncertainties. And God, as you are speaking, allow me to play the background as you take center stage. Not my words, but your words. Not my will, but your will be done. It's in a name that is above all names we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. So uh, I do need to offer this disclaimer. My understanding is you heard this scripture last week. I'm not going to put Robin on the spot like I did at the first service. I'm just going to say she didn't have to wait long for my response when she emailed me and asked me what I was going to preach. So whoever sent the email first, unimportant. What's most important? is that we're all familiar. What's most important is that we are all familiar with this story. And because we're familiar with this story, we can dig deep. So I want to talk to you this morning about a new dream. Dreams are a very interesting thing. What makes dreams most interesting to me is that from the time we are born, we are invited to articulate our expectations about what our lives can be. We are invited to share what we want to be when we grow up, where we might want to live. Sometimes people even invite us to talk about like what our families might look like in the future. And as we live, we recognize that dreams change and dreams are reshaped. Sometimes though those dreams are, shaped, are reshaped really early on in life. They're reshaped by our trusted adults and friends sometimes who, who want us to live a life that avoids disappointment. Has anyone ever had somebody tell you or discourage you from dreaming in one direction so as to not experience disappointment and shame when it doesn't go the way you think it should go? Or they try to tell you like your talents don't really align with that. You know, when you say, I wanna be a professional singer, and this was before auto-tune, and they're like, probably not, okay? <laughs> or you say things like, I feel called to be a preacher, but you are scared of public speech. That's a fear you can get out, out of, by the way, so to make sure I name that today. Or sometimes it's not at the discouragement of others that we reshape our dreams and our hopes. Sometimes there are circumstances in our lives that cause us to reshape those things. Sometimes when we look around, we recognize that we don't have the tools to get from A to B. Right? Sometimes we didn't get into the school that we were hoping to get into, right? If you're going to college, you, don't, you didn't get into it. You didn't get into the internship program or the fellowship program. And sometimes that is something that changes your dreams. Just like something very practical, didn't get in. But beyond that, sometimes we don't have the resources. Sometimes you do get in, but the financial aid letter doesn't, have all the zeros in the right places? And so sometimes those things change because of the fact that circumstances have impacted our dreams. 
But there are other times in our lives where the impact isn't because of something that we perceive as negative. It's not a negative influence. Sometimes it's quite positive. Sometimes you meet somebody and they want to live in one city and you want to live in another. And you guys find one that you're willing to compromise on. Or those of us who are parents, sometimes your dreams change because of the gift of children. You dreamed of a day in which you would get up at a certain time and go to sleep at a certain time. (laughs) That you would eat real food for dinner. (laughs) And those dreams have been reshaped by the presence of the gift of love in your life. So it's not always negative. Sometimes it is positive. But in this instant, I believe Peter has a hope and a dream for his ministry and what that might look like, what it looks like for him to follow Christ. And he is invited into allowing God to refine his dream. He has one. He has an expectation. He has some ideas, but God is going to refine those things. You guys know about Peter, right? But Peter is a man who is committed to his faith. He is deeply committed to his faith. Peter's so committed, in fact, that he is willing to put his life on the line. But before putting his life on the line, he's willing to articulate to anyone what faithfulness looks like. Peter, when Jesus appeared on the water and everyone else was scared, and Peter's like, well, Jesus, if it's you, let me walk. What? If it's you, let me walk on the water to you. Not only was Peter committed there, but Peter, when they received the gift of the Holy Spirit and everyone else was in the street trying to figure out what was wrong with these people, as if they had gone to some sort of early happy hour, Peter says they are not under the influence that you think they are. Instead, these people are filled with the Holy Spirit. And begins to share the good news. And not only that, Peter was so committed to following Jesus that Peter was willing to become a criminal to do it. Peter cut off somebody's ear when they tried to arrest him. You guys remember these stories, right? And my favorite thing about Peter is Peter was so committed to following Jesus that he decided to tell Jesus that Jesus was wrong. (laughs) When Jesus said, Sacrificing my life is part of my call. Peter was like, no, it's not. Be quiet. Right? And Jesus says what? Get behind me. Right? Calls him Satan, but that's a conversation for another day. (laughs) Get behind me. Because Jesus had clarity about what he had felt called to, but Peter didn't think that was necessary. And then history tells us that Peter was willing to pay the ultimate price because he also was crucified for following. Peter is faithful, which is why when Peter has this vision, he says, absolutely not. I will not eat that because Peter, like many of us who want to be faithful, perceived it as a test. Peter thought that seeing this vision while he was hungry was a test on whether or not he was going to allow his flesh, if you will, like Paul says, to guide his actions. And so what does he do? He says, I'm not going to let my flesh do that. I'm going to use my spirituality. I'm going to use the bringing and the sense that God has given me, and I'm not going to eat that. I absolutely will not. I don't care how hungry I am. I will not sin. And so Peter responds in that way, and God's response to him, you guys have heard it before, is you shall not call anything that God has made clean. You shall not call it profane or unclean. And so Peter's dream now for what his ministry should look like, for what God has called him to, is being reshaped by divine revelation. This is information that Peter doesn't have because for thousands of years, he has been taught that in order to be holy, you must keep a certain diet. This is information that Peter doesn't have, but somehow, some way in this vision, God reveals to him that Something different is true.
Peter is being invited to reconsider what his dreams might look like in practice by hearing directly from the one who gave him the dream in the first place. Peter is being invited to reconsider what that dream might look like by the one who gave him the dream in the first place. And I wonder how many of us are willing to allow God to speak into how our dreams come into fruition. I wonder how many of us are willing to say, God, you gave me this dream to begin with. And so I am willing to allow you to speak into it again. Instead of being so rigid that we're inflexible. And cannot receive what God is doing anew in different seasons. And so Peter is allowing that vision, his dream to be reshaped by divine revelation. And Peter, as he is receiving this revelation, he is very confused. Right? Has anyone ever heard or received an invitation from God, whether through some sort of spiritual experience or through another person? and been very confused about what they're saying and what it means? Me too. Peter was confused. And while he was still trying to make sense of what happened, he was invited to do something about it. While Peter was still trying to make sense of what happened, he was invited to start moving to action. And many of us have been taught not to move until we understand. And Peter here is invited to move even though he hasn't yet received a full understanding of what he's being called to. Because Peter hears directly from God. The people that are looking for you, I sent them. And do not hesitate, but go. I appreciate Peter's faithfulness here. I really do. Because Peter is willing to go with God in the form of this invitation from these three people, despite the fact that he has no information about them, except for what their attire tells him. There are at least one. You know, when those three men arrive from Cornelius, they come asking for Simon, who was called Peter, but they're not at Simon Peter's house, they're at Simon the Tanner's house. And I would be very concerned if my leader had just been sentenced to death and three people come looking for me at a house that's not mine, my question would be, who snitched? But they, walk, they come knocking at the door looking for Simon called Peter. And Peter does not lose his cool. I also need to say this. One of them was part of the guard, so he looked like somebody that was going to enforce or lay down the law. And I'll say it this way for y'all who missed how Peter might be experiencing this. If I was at a neighbor's house, not even a neighbor, like in another town, and the U.S. Marshal came looking for me, <laughs> but I didn't call 911, I'd be very concerned. Peter should be concerned, and yet Peter, because he hears directly from God through the Holy Spirit that those three people have been sent, Peter gets up and goes immediately. So Peter's allowing his dream for what ministry just look like to be reshaped. Here's one of the challenges, though. When Peter gets up and goes, we recognize that his mind and heart haven't really been changed. Here's what I mean. In verse 27, when Peter finally gets to Cornelius' house, it says that as he talked with them, he went in and found that many had assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know that it is improper for a Jew to associate with or to visit an outsider. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now may I ask why you sent for me? Here's the thing. Peter has the right words. We can tell by his response that his heart still isn't in it. God has shown me that I should not call anything that God has made clean, profane or unclean. So let's get to the point. Let's get to the point. 
because I can't stay too long here. Because if I stay too long here, we've all heard it this way, evil communication corrupts good manners. If I stay too long, your sin cooties are going to jump on me. If I stay too long, all of the work that I put in to be faithful is going to make me less faithful just by being associated with you. And so Peter is ready to go. And Cornelius responds to Peter and says to Peter, four days ago, I was praying when an angel appeared to me and said to me that God has heard your prayer and you need to go and send for Simon, who was called Peter, and he will share with you what he knows. Number one, divine revelation. Number two, Peter's dream for what ministry might look like is reshaped by exposure. He makes it his business to go and be with people that he normally wouldn't be with. Under God's invitation, he goes to spend some time with people that he normally wouldn't be around and he learns that they're not so bad after all. Would you look at that? He learns that they're not so bad after all. And further, he learns that the only reason they were able to connect in the first place is because they were praying to the same God all along. He learns that the reason that they were able to connect at all is because they've been praying to the same God all along. Peter, his dream and understanding of ministry is being reshaped by the fact that he has allowed himself to be exposed to people that he never would get to know. Because His initial inclination is to self-preserve. But for some reason or another, God is inviting him to get over himself. Shocker. And when Peter gets there, he has been exposed to these new people who he has been taught to avoid because of how they live their lives because their way of life is some, some, in some way, shape, or form emblematic of the fact that they are not faithful. And I wonder how many of us have grown up in places where we were taught what it looks like to be faithful. And because we were taught what it looks like to be faithful, we have avoided anything that looks unfaithful. I'm going to talk to this side over here. <laughs> how many of us have been taught to avoid people that, be, that do certain things? that speak a certain way, that dress a certain way, all in the name of being faithful Christians. Peter, though, here is invited to expose himself and be exposed to a new way of being. And I believe that God invites us to do the same. Exposure, though, is only one part of this. Because what happens is, as Peter begins to share the good news, But what God has done through Jesus Christ with this group of people that he was looking to avoid, Peter gets to experience something new. That's my last point. Sometimes our dreams are reshaped not by divine revelation, not by exposure, but by experience. As Peter is sharing the good news, something happens in the room. Verse 44 of chapter 10 says, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Peter and his companions were surprised that God could move through these other folks the same way that God was moving through them. Because they were taught to believe otherwise. And not only were they taught to believe otherwise, they practiced it. And so Peter, in this instance, has found himself 
experiencing something that we all often forget. Are you ready for it? That oftentimes, what God has been up to in our corner of the world, God is also up to in another corner of the world. Or what God is up to in our local church is what God might also be up to in the church universal. And Peter is wise enough to recognize that it's not because he's an anointed preacher that something changes. It's not because he was sent on a special assignment and brought God with him. I'm restating the same thing, I promise you, restating the same thing. Is that God was already God was already there. It wasn't because Peter was obedient just because he was obedient. It wasn't just because Peter was an apostle. It wasn't just because he was a faithful. I'm, y'all are listening. That's what I'm talking about. It wasn't just because he was a faithful Jew and he was living right. And because he was living right, he was, going, he was willing, he was actually able to go help some sinners. That wasn't it. The reason he was there was because God was working through Cornelius in that community while God was also working through Peter in his community. And when those two communities came together, something unique happened. But it doesn't stop there. Do you know what Peter does? It's my favorite thing. Peter invites the people around him not only to witness to what God is doing, but he invites them to participate. In verse 47, Peter asks this question. Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. I do not want you to miss this. Peter says to those around him, watch this. We are wrong. We shouldn't be trying to police who can and cannot come to the altar. We shouldn't be trying to police who can and cannot enter these doors. We shouldn't be trying to curate other people's experience of faith by placing expectations or prerequisites on them. Peter says they've already had a willing heart and God's Presence is evident here, and as a result, here's what I'm going to invite you to do. Here's what Peter says. I'm going to invite you to graft them into the community the same way that we are. I'm going to invite you to graft them into the community the same same way that we are, despite our differences. Whether they be ethnic, cultural, socioeconomic, ideological. I'm going to invite you friends who are with me to make space for them at this table as well. And you want to know why? And we believe this as United Methodists. It's because it's not our table anyway. It's not our table anyway. And so Peter says, how dare we withhold the waters of baptism from these people who God is so clearly working through just because we don't have the same idea of what holiness looks like. And so they graft them into the community through the waters of baptism. And not only that, they stay together for several days. Don't miss that. they begin to develop relationship. Not just over a meal, not just over one idea, but over the biggest idea that any of them could ever hope to grasp. And that is what God had done for everyone through Jesus Christ. This last thing I want to share with you. Are 
Are you guys familiar with how social stratification works? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> social stratification, right? How we experience success, right? Or we gain wealth, we gain access. Most times, we proclaim that the reason we experience certain levels of success and certain levels of social stratification is because we worked hard. It's because we worked hard. But you know what the research shows? Research shows that that hard work is undergirded by relationships, what we would call network. It lets us know that sometimes it's not what you know, it's and who knows you and who can cover you when you don't know. Uh oh. Sometimes it's about who you know. Sometimes it is about what schools you went to. Sometimes it is about where you've worked. Sometimes it is about who your parents' friends are. Just sometimes, not all the time, just sometimes. And it is making the best of those resources. Don't hear me wrong, right? It is making the best of those resources. That's why we all want to make sure our children and grandchildren go to good schools and live in particular areas. We all desire that because we understand that relationships are important. The problem is we just fail to articulate it. And so relationship is a very important factor in success. It is also the absence of those same relationships that contribute to our downfall or lack thereof, lack of success. I told y'all last time I was here, I was a pastor in South Dallas for a long time before I ended up in Prosper. And those are two very different worlds. I just want to be very clear about that. Two very different worlds. And what I learned when I was working in, in South Dallas with a lot of our unhoused neighbors was that what helped contribute to their homelessness was the fact that they didn't have anyone they can call when they needed to borrow $1,000. They didn't have anyone who can act as a guarantor on a loan or on a lease for them. They didn't have anyone who can sign on a dotted line to get them out of a jam by retaining a lawyer who was effective. And that helped contribute they're down. Well, not the only thing, but we all know how important it is to have people you can call on when you get in trouble. And if you've never been in trouble, this sermon is for you. Because remember, Peter had never been in trouble either. Peter had never been in trouble either. But the same research also shows that one of the greatest Contributors to building relationship across the lines of difference and creating a network is not actually public schools. That it's not mixed income housing developments. One of the most effective ways of securing relationships that will draw you across class lines is religious communities. Shocker. One of the most effective means of developing relationships across lines of difference, particularly socioeconomic difference, is religious community. And we saw it play out here in this text, where people that never get together all of a sudden are together around the same idea. And I'm just curious, how many of us are open to allowing God to reshape our vision of what our churches should look like? I wonder how many of us are willing to allow God to reshape our dreams and hopes for what our communities might look like. I wonder how many of us are willing to allow God to speak into the yes that we offered a long time ago and invite us into a new way of being. Not because what we've done isn't good enough, 
But because what we've done in the past isn't working now, and even if it isn't working now, what we learn by saying yes to what God is doing is that God still is. This is the word of God for people of God. Thanks be to God.